Praise the Lord, everyone. This is Pastor Whitfield coming to you on this Wednesday, June 24, 2015, welcoming you to our Wednesday night time in the Word, our social media midweek broadcast. We are so thankful to the Lord for you tuning in and watching us whenever you have the time to do so. And we pray that the Word of the Lord was is a continuous blessing unto you and to yours. Today we're going to be looking at a subject that the Lord himself placed in my heart. I was out visiting a church on this past Sunday, and as I was listening to the pastor preaching, he started off by talking about many things that he had seen and was concerned with. He's an older gentleman, retirement age, and this was an opportunity that he had to speak into the lives of younger people. And as I was sitting there listening to him, I heard the Holy Spirit speak up and say in a voice that I could hear, even above the preacher, I hate divorce. So tonight we're going to look at that particular subject. I know that many of you have gone through divorces, have been in families that have experienced divorces. Some of you may have gone through a horrible divorce yourself, or you may have been a child, a young child at the time that your parents may have experienced divorces. But yet, understand that God is a God that heals us from all the negativity, all the hurts, all the wounds, and all those things that have transpired as a result of going through being part of of a divorce. So let us pray and we'll go right into the word of the Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Father, we thank you in the precious name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, from whom all blessings flow. And Father, we thank you that every single blessing that you have for us is contained within your word. And it's your word that we find our confidence in. It's your word that we find solace in. It's your word that builds us up and fortifies us and makes us stronger in you. So, Father, we pray today in the name of Jesus Christ as we go into your word. Cause your word to bring healing, health, and wholeness for all those broken areas. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I'm going to be going to Malachi, the second chapter. I'm going to be looking at verses 13, and I'll jump down to verse 16. But in your spare time, read the entire chapter of Malachi. Malachi is a very short book. It's the last book in the Old Testament, right before the book of Matthew, which starts the New Testament. So let us begin reading of the word today. Let's read Malachi, the second chapter, starting at verse 13, and we'll jump down to verse 16 in just a moment. It says, And this you do with double guilt. You cover the altar of the Lord with tears, shed by your unoffending wives, divorced by you, that you might take heathen wives, and with your own weeping and crying out, because the Lord does not regard your offering anymore, or accept it with favor at your hand. Jumping down to verse 15, actually. Actually, let's do verse 14 as well. Yet you ask, why does he reject it? Because the Lord was witness to the covenant made at your marriage between you and the wife of your youth, against whom you have dealt treacherously, and to whom you were faithless. Yet she is your companion, and the wife of your covenant made by your marriage vows. And did not God make you and your wife one flesh? Did not one make you and preserve your spirit alive? And why did God make you two? Or why did God make you two one? Because he sought a godly offspring from your union. Therefore take heed to yourselves, and let no one deal treacherously and be faithless to the wife of his youth. For the Lord, the God of Israel, says, I hate divorce and marital separation. 
and him who covers his garment, his wife, with violence. Therefore, keep a watch upon your spirit, that it may be controlled by my spirit, that ye deal not treacherously and faithlessly with your marriage mate. You have wearied the Lord with your words, yet you say, in what way have we wearied him? Ye do it when you, by your actions, you say, Every one who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delights in them, or by asking, Where is the God of justice? Thus, the reading of the Lord. Because we know that spiritually, God is talking about us putting away our relationship with him first and foremost, and seeking after those things that are not godly. If you remember in the book of Ezra, when, they, when the children of Israel returned from their captivity with Nehemiah, and they began to build the city again, and they began to read from the book of the law of the Lord. And at one point, Ezra tells them to put away their strange wives. They had married, intermarried with foreigners that did not practice the ways of godliness. This has nothing to do with interracial marriages. This has everything to do with marrying someone that does not live according to the belief systems of God and godliness that walks apart from God and that will ultimately lead your heart away from God. Solomon is a perfect example of them because he loved, the Bible says, many strange women. And those women practice a lot of ungodly things. They worship idols. They worship spirits. They worship things that ultimately cause Solomon to come and worship those things that he should not. And he knew better. Solomon was the wisest man that ever walked the face of the earth. But yet his heart was led astray by all of the strange women that he married and intermarried with. But if we go back to our base scripture for our study today, in Malachi, the second chapter, the 13 voices, is, and this is God talking through the prophet Malachi. And it says, and this you do with double guilt. So he's telling the person or the man figure here, male figure, that whatever he is doing, he is doing it with double guilt, not singleness of guilt, but with double guilt. You will cover the altar of the Lord with tears, shed by your unoffending wives, divorced by you, that you might take heathen wives. They found the women that they were with and married of their own culture, of their own nationality, no longer to be attractive to them. And they were led astray by other women that they thought would make them better companions. The Bible tells us even in the in the Matthews or the Gospel when Jesus taught that if a person divorces his spouse or her spouse for the express purposes of remarrying someone else, then they have committed adultery. And so has the person to whom they have married in such a situation. So here God is dealing with a thought process that has gone awry to say that it would be better for me to vacate this marital situation to be united with someone else or that someone may feel would make them a better companion. That is the spirit of adultery, as well as if a person stays in a marital relationship and commits a sexual act with someone else, that is also committing the act of adultery. That is leaving that one that you have been united with by a covenant vow, vow of a covenant, 
that you made before God and have left that relationship in order to seek the relationship or the comfort of the solace or the embrace or intimacy with someone else other than your spouse. But God goes on to say, but they're weeping with your own weeping and crying out because, because the Lord does not regard your offering anymore or accept it with favor at your hands. Whenever someone does that, God no longer accepts their offerings or embrace them or regards them until they acknowledge the guilt that they've imposed upon themselves and that they must come to the understanding that the agreement with God that was made and that you have walked away from a situation that God never once intended for you to walk away from. And to whom to you were faithless, yet she is your companion, the wife of your covenant, made by your marriage vows. And did not God make you and your wife one? Did not God make you and your spouse? Here, this is talking to the priesthood. If you read the entire chapter of, of Malachi, the second chapter, he is really talking to the priesthood. The priesthood who was leaving their wives for other women and for other marital opportunities. But here God says, did not God make you and your wife one flesh? Did not one make you and preserve your spirit alive? And why did God make you two one? Because he sought a godly offspring from your union. He was not only seeking children, but he was seeking offspring of righteousness. He was looking for the forging and the forming of a righteous seed, of a righteous nature, of two hearts being bound together, ultimately becoming one. And in the oneness of the union, that you would produce a holy seed, the seed of objectivity, the seed that makes others see you as being righteous in the eyesight of God, one that will cause others to see that union and marriage is a holy divine thing in the sight of God, and that it is truly acceptable and honorable. And as a result of the love, the intensity of the love that exists within that union, communications are proper and effective. Love is free-flowing. Communication is effectual and effective and profitable and prudent, discreet, wise, yielding a heart of continual love. And in the heart of continual love in that relationship, the two hearts come together and they create by sharing their seed and producing a holy seed, and children that are born of that particular union. Therefore, take heed to yourselves and let no one deal treacherously and be faithless to the wife of his youth. For the Lord God of Israel says, I hate divorce. And when the Holy Ghost spake it to me, he spake it with an attitude of how he hates the spirit of divorce and the influence of it. And understand that God is talking about the spirit of it that he hates. He hates the spirit of divorce. Because I believe there are times that we just simply marry the wrong people. And that relationship is not 
going to work. But there are times when we marry the right people that God has ordained. And yet the devil, I want you to hear me clearly, the devil ushers in the spirit of divorce and causes one to see the hopelessness of even a marriage being repaired and continuing, and continuing to the point that it will become prosperous and it becomes worth continuing in. So let's just take a look at some of the things that causes the devil's seed. Notice I said early because God is looking for the seed of a man and the seed of a woman, to come together to make a righteous seed. So when the seed of the devil enters in, it brings in the spirit of divorce. Now listen to what the devil's seed is. The devil's seed is when people marry and they are un equally yoked. The Bible says in the book of Corinthians, if memory serves me correctly, that we're not to be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. You can marry someone that is, that is an unbeliever and you will pay dearly because of your belief systems being diversely different from theirs. They're not going to honor the things that you honor. They're not going to worship who you worship. They're not going to believe in the things that you believe in. And they're going to have a very difficult time understanding you, comprehending you, and embracing some of your belief systems. There are times that you can marry a, a person who says that they are a believer, but they have no relationship, no commitment. They are carnal Christians. Their carnality equates to unbelief because they're not walking in the depths of belief that God intends for them to walk in. They may believe God on certain levels, but when it comes to other things, as far as the walk, living free from sin, they may not believe in that. They may believe that they can still go out here and fornicate and do other things that the Bible says that they shouldn't when the marriage covenant already commits them to one. But their heart is still divided. That's why you should make sure that someone is sound in the faith before even coming on board with them. Also, the seeds of the devil, anger, bitter, bitterness, unforgiveness. One of the major things in marriage that the devil breaks down is unforgiveness between spouses because something happened and we have the tendency to constantly, repetitively bring up past issues, unresolved issues. And every time that there's a disagreement, it may not have anything to do with the situation at all. And we bring up this old, dead, unresolved, unburied issue that we should have killed a long time ago. We shouldn't even be talking about this anymore. Something that happened years ago. But yet we're still existing in the past because of the spirit of unforgiveness, that seed from the devil. Adulteries, when we have walked away from our relationships and sought comfort and intimacy in the embrace of another that is not one spouse and have physical, sexual intercourse with that person. Now we have become committed so wise to that other person and still yet committed to that other person, our spouse in marriage, but yet we've broken the covenantal, covenantal vow between the two of us, something that God despises, even in our relationship with him. 
God does not want us to commit spiritual adultery, nor does he want us to commit physical adultery. But even people have committed what's called an emotional form of adultery. They never have physical intimacy, but they're so dependent upon someone else for their emotional health and well-being and not that of their spouses. And you can get to that point when you're discontent, unhappy, in a marital relationship, or you feel unfulfilled and something is lacking. And there are times we also deal with intimate, or that in, in a situation where it's also the person's physical presence. If you're married and you become overly giddy, like a school child, and infatuated with a person that you're around, and you're married, you need to drop back and ask yourself some serious questions about what's going on in your psyche, what's going on in your mind, what's going on in your heart. Have you reached the point of discontent so much so that now you have begun to find fulfillment not only just in a physical person, but sometimes we can find comfort in an in, inanimate objects. Oh yes, we think that adultery and emotional affairs is only with an individual. But there are persons that have taken on hobbies. They're spending more time with their hobbies or with their collections of things or doing other things, hanging out. And just doing things to avoid being in that relationship to work on repairs. Also, poor financial planning. When we don't, when we don't hold ourselves accountable to how we're expending or spending our resources. Are we responsible? Are we irresponsible? At the end of the day, do our, are our checks bouncing? Are we accountable to one another for what we make and what we earn and bring into the home? Because just like a business, a marriage is just like running a business. You have to have financial health. And even if you're not making enough to cover the expenses, then other decisions may need to be made. Maybe someone may need to get a part-time job. Maybe we need to look at what we're spending our resources on. Maybe we need to cut some things out. Maybe we need to downscale some things. Maybe we need to get rid of that expensive car. Maybe we need to downsize our home or our apartment. Or we may just need to look at how often are we shopping for clothes? How often are we eating out? Do we have a savings account? Do we have something to fall back on in a rainy day? All of these decisions are vital to the health and the happiness of a successful marriage. Sometimes there is dishonesty that is flourishing in a situation where we're not being honest and truthful and trustworthy one with the other. And once trust has been broken, it takes multiple years to restore that and to regain a person's trust. So what are we doing to keep the trust factor in place? Because trust is one of the major things that God looks at, and we all should be looking at in a marriage. Also, a failure to let go of one's past negative experience. Too many times people get married and bring their baggage into marital situations. They have not gotten over with Johnny or Joanne or Bobby or Sue Ellen has done to them. And not realizing that they've not gone through the healing process. And yet because of the loneliness of their heart, they hook up with someone else. And they take those same issues into the next relationship and they hold that new person who has not done anything 
along the lines that those previous persons have done, but yet that person holds them just as liable and accountable to things that has happened in their past and thinking that they're going to commit and do the same things to them without realizing that this is a new person that needs a new chance, but they also are deserving of a person that is fully healed, fully cleansed, and fully has forgiven all those persons from their past. And this person's mentality coming in to a new relationship is to have a clean bill of mental, emotional, and physical health so that the marriage or the relationship that they have now entered into can thrive based upon their own mutual experiences together as they walk as one and become one with the other. There are a lot of times that people in a marriages with a fantasy view of what marriage should be. This is not Fantasy Island. There's no Mr. Rourke and no tattoo to fulfill your fantasy. Marriage is work. Marriage is work. The two of you working together to build it, to make it, to become that which you're desirous of in the eyesight and the presence of the Lord. Not making it something that it isn't, but making it what God intends and desires for it to become. Working together as one, realizing that all fantasies that I may have in my mind or in my thought processes, I need to get rid of them before I make that covenantal agreement. And if I am in a covenant agreement now, I need to rebuke the spirit of fantasies, bring myself into reality, and work on the premises of what's real. And was false. And to build a healthy, wholesome relationship on the realities of what marriage really should be. Yes, he may have appeared to be your knight in shining armor. Yes, she may have had a Coca-Cola shape. But yet, what is in the heart that makes and qualifies this as something that is doable, that this person will be and shall be my life's partner until God takes one or the other home. When husband and wife walk as one and understand that life is real and marriage is real and that there will be some difficulties, we approach it in a completely different thought process. And we take it there by understanding you have faults, I have faults. You're going to give me some difficulty as well as I will you. But at the end of the day, what will make our thought processes about this union healthy, sound, and emotionally charged to do good and to stick together and build our lives together. And if we do want to embark on something that others do not, we do so with the two of us, with each other in mind, and God's principles first and foremost. But we cannot approach it with a fantasy view of what life and marriage is. We also at times... One of the other seeds that destroy marriage is comparison with another's success rather than focusing on your marital success. You cannot determine the success of your marriage based upon the success of someone else's marriage. You don't know what people have gone through to get 
to where they are in their marital relationship. You don't know the pain, the toil, the agony, the disappointment, the heartbreaks, and yet their desire and willingness to stick together. And we tend to look at people as though they were always that way. But yet, we look at what they acquired, what they have obtained, and how they dress and how they carry themselves. You can have all those things and financial soundness and health and still have a bad marriage because there was no connecting of the hearts. And this is the thing that God really wants, is the hearts to be connected. We over-focus on problems rather than solutions or resolutions. If, if any place we should have crucial conversational skills, it should be in the confines of marriage. When we could sit down and understand the emotional involvement that someone else has in that relationship or in their thought processes, and we take the time to understand that emotion that they're tied into and take the time to understand our emotional buy-in or tie-in and look to settle our emotions, to calm one another's emotions down, to de-escalate, then to come back and to understand what the other is saying and from that vantage point, having them understand clearly. A lot of times we talk at each other. Then instead of talking to each other. And understanding what the other is saying. Because if we come to the point that I'm going to sit down. And I'm going to take the time to understand why this situation is so upsetting to my spouse. Let me put myself in their shoes and let me walk the path that they're walking in and allow me to feel all that emotional charge and disdain that they may have. Maybe perhaps I can better understand them and how to de-escalate and move this situation to the phase that it truly needs to be in. Don't over-focus on the problem, but rather expend your time and your energy working on a resolution. Solve your issues. Solve your problems. That's why the, the Bible says, don't let the sun go down. Don't go to bed angry. Even if you have to agree to disagree until you can come down and say, we're going to block out this amount of time and we're going to sit down and we're going to tackle this issue until we meet a meaningful resolution that works for the both of us and we're going to stick to it and we're going to abide by our agreement. Remember, your marriage is an agreement. So why can we not continuously make agreements to solidify the initial agreement? Why can't we ratify our contracts in faith before the Lord God himself, asking him to help us to get to that point where it's a signed, sealed, firmly sealed deal forever and that nothing will come that will come out would ever be a deal breaker for this union or this relationship we must allowing the devil to plant seeds of discord i see this all the time people allow the devil to plant thought processes in their mind about their spouse and so much so that that other person begins, or that person, that that thought process of what's planted in their mind, begins to believe it as truth. Now, we've all done it from time to time. We've heard people in conversations talking, and we assumed 
that they were talking about us. And just imagine how that played on our mind. How deeply that played on our thought processes. How we thought about it and all the emotions that tied into it. And how the devil just kept it going by adding things. Adding this and adding that. That person, for instance, the person you call a person, they didn't call you back. Then you go through your mind. I know that that person's out doing something that they're not supposed to be doing. I know they're with Johnny you, Joe Blow and, and all that stuff. I know that they're doing this and that. And I know they're talking about me and all that. And I know that she's trying to leave and all that. And the thing is, you get so worked up and come to find out. That none of it was true in the first place. Why do we allow the devil to play with our minds like that? Something that is so sensitive. Something that determines the, our course of life. And how we would interact. And even when we, some of us, we have gone off on people based upon unfounded information. A thought process that the devil put in our minds about a situation or a scenario and there was no truth to it. And because we were so emotionally charged and believed it, believed it, we did not let it go. And we caused more harm than good with that situation. God never wants us to allow the devil to plant the seeds of discord in our mind. Then another thing, we get into the blame game, the Adam and Eve syndrome that I like to call it. But God, it was that woman that gave it to me. God, it was that serpent that gave that to me. But no one took responsibility for their actions. No one took ownership of what transpired. It takes a big person, especially in a marital situation, to come back and say to their spouse, baby, you know what? I blew it. That was my fault. And I do apologize to you. And I see the error of my way, and I mean it will never happen again. And take the appropriate posture and behavior to correct it so that it does not happen again. Allowing the devils to plant the seed of discord or the blame game. And listen, one of the other things that we do in marriage that we fail to do, we did it in the very beginning. We neglect and fail to continue to date our spouses. We ought to know that as we age, our bodies go through changes. I have gray hair. The Bible tells us not to despise gray hair, but at times, I wish my hair was still dark. But yet, there are times we gain a pop belly. We can't, we're not as physically active. Our bodies can't do the things that we used to do. Sometimes women, when they have children, their bodies expand. And although they may not want to be, but sometimes losing that weight becomes a very difficult process. But yet, this is your boo. You loved her prior. Why not continue to love her and to respect one another? We go through changes as we age. I used to be able to see without glasses. Now I cannot go without wearing them. But our bodies go through changes as well as our thought processes. But we must continue to date and show the other that we're interested in them. It's nothing wrong with paying your spouse compliments. Tell your wife or your husband how good they look to you. You can rest assured that if you don't, someone else will. And they will cause you, in some cases, to become jealous when they tell you that someone else is looking at them and told them that they look good. Not that the other person is looking at them in an ill way, nor it may not be your spouse's intent to even garnish that type of attention. But for some reason or another, they have. It's okay, men, to tell your spouse, you look great, baby. Wives, it's okay to tell your husband, you're rocking that suit today, baby. It is okay to pay one another's compliments and let them know that you love them. 
embrace one another, kiss one another, and let one another know how you appreciate, how regardless of how old you are. Do some of those things that you used to do in your youthful days when you first came together. Shock her by taking her out to dinner to her favorite place and giving her some roses. Shock him by, by getting some of his favorite cologne or perfume or whatever he likes to see you wear in. Or get him something that he may like. But do things for one another to show your appreciation and your love to one another. Diffuse the devil. Show him that you hate the spirit of divorce just as much as God himself hates the spirit of divorce. The list of all the seeds that the double plant is endless. But our time is up. We're going to continue this teaching on Sunday because we are nowhere near done this. Because I want you to see all the seeds that the devil wants to sow into to a marriage that is failing. And give you some tools for a prosperous, successful marriage. So share this message with your friends, your family members, your co-workers, your church members. Those that are struggling because the wisdom of God. It's coming through this series. I hate divorce. And God wants us to hate it just as much as he does. This is Pastor Whiffle saying, I want your marriage to survive. And I want your seed to be blessed. And I want you to be an example of what God intended true marriages to be. We'll see you back here on Sunday morning for our weekly broadcast. God bless you. Until then, have a wonderful, blessed day in the Lord Jesus Christ.